Hello, my friends. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Today, I would like to take a moment to talk about a phenomenon that I like to call wishful thinking after the revolution. And examining this idea shows us exactly what kind of people we're dealing with when we talk about, very broadly, leftist revolutionaries. This is the earliest instance I can find of this phenomenon. This is from 2017 on Twitter. Y'all ever think about what your roles will be post-revolution? The first person, Groucho Marx, says, I hope to be a therapist, maybe for general trauma, but maybe re-educating the antisocial tendencies out of people in a gulag. Quest Riggs says, this is a great thread. Red Army or the party if they'd take me. If not, communal farming. J.L. Hamilton says, logistics for the new Red Army. Uniform design and equipment procurement. Now, the first level analysis of this is that all of these people are simply delusional. They think they would actually be allowed to control their own destinies in some individualistic manner after a socialist or communist or anarchist or whatever revolution. Even if they support those politics and supported that revolution, we all know that there is no way they would simply be allowed to do whatever they want. In fact, that's why there's so many memes of communist soldiers saying, that's amusing, please face the wall now. These people are the useful idiots that Yuri Bezmenov described, the ones that ideologically truly believe in socialism. And yet, after the power structure that protects them, namely liberal democracy, is destroyed, the true revolutionaries have no more use for them, so they are lined up and shot. So it's very easy on a surface level to just look at this and laugh at these people, for not understanding the nature of politics or power, and for being true believers in an absolutely horrible ideology. But that's only a surface level critique of this stuff. For example, look at Groucho Marx's reply again. She wants to be re-educating antisocial tendencies out of people in a gulag. So in a non-political sense, antisocial personality disorder is sociopathy. It's a mental disorder in which a person consistently shows no regard for right or wrong and ignores the rights and feelings of others. They tend to antagonize, manipulate, or treat others harshly or with callous indifference. They show no guilt or remorse for their behavior. But this is not the, the socialist or anarchist view of antisocial. In a more casual sense, antisocial has come to mean not interested in social activities. You know, you want to stay inside and play video games all day instead of playing with your friends as a kid. That's an antisocial activity. In the political sense, on the left, there is this idea, and yes, I've gone over it a dozen times before on this channel. It's from Marx's On the Jewish Question of anti-individualism as a virtue. I do need to explain this, but I also don't want to beat a dead horse completely. We've, we've gone over this many times in this channel. So just very quickly, in On the Jewish Question, Karl Marx critiques the liberal idea of individualism. And there's a long passage on this, but I'll just read a short little bit of it. Liberty is the right to do everything which does not harm others. The limits within each individual can act without harming others are determined by law, just as the boundary between two fields is marked by a stake. It is a question of the liberty of man regarded as an isolated monad, withdrawn into himself. But liberty as a right of man is not founded upon the relations between man and man, but rather upon the separation of man from man. It is the right of separation, the right of the circumscribed individual withdrawn into himself. Marx's critique here is that liberalism enshrines the right of one individual to stand separate and apart from other individuals. When, Marx argues, correctly I might add, that the true meaning of life comes from not who we stand separate from, but who we have connections with. And this is, of course, true. Look at your friends, look at your family, look at your spouse. These are people that you're not standing separate from as a rugged individualist. You have some emotional connection there. Marx's critique is that that emotional connection is not enshrined as a right. And of course it shouldn't be, because these are voluntary things. You should have the option to choose who you are closely connected with and who you are strangers with. However, Marx did not agree. Marx believed that because you have some kind of economic connection between, say, the person that you buy your food from, that economic connection engenders a permanent social obligation and responsibility. Because you've engaged in trade with this person, they now have a say in what you do and you now have a say in what they do. And it's this interlocking web that creates a society. And so if you are an individual separated, as Marx said, an isolated monad, that is an ego, that is an egoist, antisocial way for an individual to act within a society. And so the socialist prescription is that has to be stopped. That's why you see a lot of people like this Groucho Marx woman who says, re-educating antisocial tendencies out of people. That is the anti-individualism 
within socialism. But despite being massively made fun of, this question keeps coming up. What's your job in the leftist commune? I'm going to be leading discussion on theories some days, making clothes from scraps in other days, and making lattes whenever needed. Oh boy, that sounds great. Our, our glorious communist utopia, we're all living on the leftist commune. Who's making the food? I don't know. I'm reading theory, making clothes from scraps, and making coffee. That's all I can do. That's, that's the only skills that I have. What will be your position after communism is achieved? Oh Jesus, look at the quote tweets. Holy shit. Missionary. Doggy. <laughs> Man, so many of these quote tweets are laughing at these people. I think everyone knows how stupid this is now. Hey, look at the delusion here. I'm going to be a local bookish person who fishes a few times a week, teaches loosely organized seminars on history and philosophy, and spends a lot of time hanging out with her lover in the forest. Why would you be allowed? It's the people's forest. Those are all the people's resources that you're using. The collective interest comes before your bourgeois desire to hang out in the forest and contribute nothing to society. Here's one who kind of has the basic idea down, at least. The dirty jobs that are necessary, fair enough. Getting under the buildings and working on pipes. Roof repairs. Digging trenches for the many purposes of a trench. Maybe, maybe the one that you'll end up in? Pretty much anything manual labor that is required to fulfill the need of the community. I happily offer my contributions. You can do that now. You can get those jobs right now. What are my special talents? Music, mathematics, and teaching are some of my skills. Under communism, those skills will be harnessed for the benefit of the collective. The new human will be built on the basis of the new community, existing inside the new international society. How is this any different than the fascist conception of individuals working for the glory of the state? The only dif difference seems to be that the state, in this conception, spans the entire world. These people's conception of what communism looks like is just fascism that is universalized rather than being particular to one people or one ethnic group but it's ultimately the same system what job are guys gonna have under communism i'm thinking i'll be a hunter in the morning a fisherman in the afternoon a herdsman in the evening and a critic after dinner oh boy this is actually also again a quote of marx's this time from the German ideology. This is a book I haven't yet covered on the channel. The division of labor implies the contradiction between the interest of the separate individual or the individual family and the communal interest of all individuals who have intercourse with one another. And indeed, this communal interest does not exist merely in the imagination as the general interest, but first of all in reality as the mutual interdependence of the individuals among whom the labor is divided. And finally, the division of labor offers us the first example of how, as long as man remains in natural society, that is, as long as a cleavage exists between the particular and the common interest. As long, therefore, as activity is not voluntarily but naturally divided, man's own deed becomes an alien power opposed to him, which enslaves him instead of being controlled by him. This section is partially reaffirming what was said in On the Jewish Question, where Marx believes that this communal interest, this lasting bond between people who have casual contact with each other, a bond that exerts some kind of control, some kind of right, which is something that liberals don't believe. We believe in individualism. We believe in separation between uninvolved parties. But that doesn't exist within the Marxist framework. As soon as the distribution of labor comes into being, each man has a particular exclusive sphere of activity, which is forced upon him and from which he cannot escape. He is a hunter, a fisherman, a herdsman, or a critical critic, whatever that means, and must remain so if he does not want to lose his means of livelihood. While in a communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow. To hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming a hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. And that's the quote that this person is appealing to. Of course, we all understand how stupid this is, right? You could be a hunter in the morning, a fisherman in the afternoon, a herdsman in the evening, and a critic after dinner, but then you would be shitty at all of them. I made this point back during that video about the woman who worked at LinkedIn who had an extremely cushy life. The reason that we have the society that we have is because of division of labor and how the division of labor allowed people to become extremely specialized. A person who only hunts in the morning will never be as good a hunter as somebody who hunts all day every day. That difference between them will lead to a difference in output. The truly amazing hunter who has practiced his craft his entire life will be the one who actually brings home the bacon, not the person who lazily hunts in the morning and doesn't really contribute anything. And in fact, that's why our society is what it is, because people have specialized, and with that specialization comes high-level skill, and with that high-level skill comes high-quality and high-quantity output. 
And this is the primary reason why the question of what will you do after the revolution is not only jokey and stupid as something that we can turn into memes and make fun of because it really is just brainless, but it also shows how incredibly ignorant socialists actually are. The destruction of all barriers between everything, as well as the destruction of, of standards, which is something that the left definitely trends towards, that also necessarily means the destruction of the ability to become competent at a thing. So when Marx says that he'll be a hunter in the morning, a fisherman in the afternoon, a herdsman in the evening and a critic after dinner, that would be a truly hellish society if that's how everyone was behaving because we need specialization. We need people doing the same jobs and becoming really good at them. This is a system that just instantly falls apart because no one's actually producing what is necessary to keep society running. You can't be a brain surgeon in the morning, a mechanic of large machinery in the afternoon, an architect in the evening, and then like a high level chemist at night. Almost nobody can get good enough at all of these things. They're just too complicated. Th things are things are just too hard. These people genuinely believe there will be no work within a communist system. They can all just laze around and enjoy the fruits of somebody's labor. I don't know who's. Who's doing the work? This is why these people always say such dumb shit like abolish work. They just don't know what's happening behind the curtain to keep society running. So yeah, this after the revolution rhetoric, there's really two ways to look at it. And the first way is that it's funny, it's memes. You can We can laugh at how stupid these people are. They have no idea how anything works, and they are young, dumb, entitled, bourgeois champagne socialists. And the second way to look at it is the underlying philosophy, which is not only anti-liberal, but anti-individual, anti-freedom, anti-human flourishing. And no matter how much they talk about the utopia or how free everyone will be or, or anything else like that, what lies beneath is this deep desire to control other people in the name of of the collective interest. These are not good people. Best case scenario, they're delusional dumb kids who will grow up. However, it's absolutely the case that some of these people, if given the chance, would be just as fucking terrible as some of the worst monsters in history if some other monster didn't get to them first. But hey, the best thing we can do in either case is keep laughing. We've seen many times humor is what disarms tyrants. All right, I'm getting out of here. I'm sure you can tell this video is kind of off the cuff. I don't have any of this written down. I'm just kind of I'm just kind of spouting from the hip. I have to go and actually record a scripted video now. I was just doing this one for fun. Okay, I'll see you next time, guys. I love you.